Good morning. It is good to be with you today. Today we're going to talk about suffering. We're not talking about suffering in general, philosophical issues surrounding the question of suffering. We're not talking about suffering of people who live a long ways away from us, or even the suffering that unbelievers experience. We're asking the question of why God allows his children to suffer. Some of you in here have actually gone through some suffering recently or are currently going through suffering. Some of you are feeling the loss of your friend, Joy, who we've talked about in here recently because she was a vibrant young woman who loved the Lord. And this message today is for you. Some of you found out things over your break, uh, information about family members, situations that you didn't know about, and you are internally suffering today. This message is for you. Some of you have, have something that's been ongoing, something that you're struggling with, something that really, truly hurts, and I am praying that the Lord is gonna do something with you today as well. And some of you haven't suffered nearly as much as others in here, but you will at some point, and this message is also for you. Why does God allow his children to suffer? Many times when we, when we struggle, when we uh, try to make sense out of what's going on, we want an answer why does God allow, to the question of why does God allow us to suffer? Now the short answer to that question is God has a thousand reasons for why he might allow us to suffer. God is God, his thoughts and his purposes are vast. His purposes in your suffering might be for you, uh, particular things he's trying to do in you and we'll talk about some of those things. They could be for people who are around you, your family and your friends. Uh, God might be trying to do something in them. It might be something to do with your church. Who knows, it could have something to do with your children and your grandchildren and your great-grandchildren. It could have something to do with what God is working out his plans in history or the, the conflict in the heavenlies between angels and demons or even what he's doing to set up the new heavens and the new earth. Who knows, right? It's God. He has a thousand purposes in suffering and when you are in the midst of suffering, Usually, he'll only show you one or two or three, and usually those are after the fact as well. So whenever we come to suffering, we cannot have a simple, this is what God is doing there. God could have many purposes. I find comfort in that, actually, being able to rely and trust in a sovereign God. Did you know, though, that, that in, the, in the book of 2 Corinthians, there are eight explicit reasons for why God allows sufferings? There are eight times in the book where it says, these things happen so that, and then gives us a reason. And today in our passage, actually, we're gonna look at two of these. This, that, this means that of the thousand reasons that God might allow suffering to occur, there's specific reasons listed in scripture for which God has in the past sometimes allowed suffering. Now, this doesn't mean that these are the specific reasons for which he is allowing you to suffer in the present, but it does raise the possibility significantly that these could be among the things that God is trying to do in this particular situation. Now we're launching a series this semester on 2 Corinthians, especially our Monday chapels. 2 Corinthians, you need to know, is one of my favorite books of the New Testament, and I'll tell you why. 2 Corinthians, Paul just rips his heart open. He's just wide open. He is more self-disclosing in 2 Corinthians than I think any other book except perhaps Philippians, but, but 2 Corinthians is longer, so I think that 2 Corinthians actually still beats out Philippians in this. Paul is very self-disclosing. In fact, in chapter 6, there's a point where he says, he says, open your hearts wide to us. We've opened our hearts to you. So how about if we take a posture of openness and submissiveness to God's word for a moment. Just take your hands and cup them before, just right in front of you like this, and just repeat this after me. Lord, open my heart this morning. Go ahead and say that. I open my heart to your word. Lord, open my heart this morning. I open my heart to your word. All right, take your Bibles and open them to 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 3 through 10. Paul wastes no time at all getting personal here. By the way, while you're looking at that passage, let me say one thing about this passage. This is one of my favorite sections of the entire Bible. It's very meaningful to me. 
And part of the reason for that is that my wife and I, my wife Trudy and I, we lived in Turkey for seven years. And the events that take place here happen in western Turkey where we lived for seven years. And during those times there, when we lived there, this was precious passage to me as I realized that Paul had gone through some of the things, uh, or we were going through some of the things that he had experienced. The other reason is that this last year, just this past year, 2014, is that my, my now almost 25-year-old daughter, Lydia, she almost died twice. And during that process, the Lord made this passage rich to me. I'll tell you a little bit more about that as this message opens up. So when I open this passage, you need to know, it's kind of like opening up my journal and sharing my heart with you. And I'm doing that with the hope that God will minister to you and help you in the midst of your own sufferings. One of the thousands or two of the thousands of reasons for which God allows sufferings in our life are in this passage. The first is in verses three to seven, and then the second is in verses eight through 10. Why does God allow his children to suffer? The first reason God allows his children to suffer to prepare them to minister to others in the future. Look at verses three to seven. Second Corinthians chapter one. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our affliction so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. For as we share abundantly in Christ's suffering, so through Christ we share abundantly in comfort too. If we are afflicted, it is for your comfort and salvation. And if we are comforted, it is for your comfort, which you experience when you patiently endure the same sufferings that we suffer. Our hope for you is unshaken, for we know that as you share in our sufferings, you will also share in our comfort. God allows his children to suffer because he's preparing them and training them to minister to others in the future. The word comfort, is obviously the most important word here, but let me just say something about the word paraklesis in Greek is not sort of a soothingness, at least as it's found in the New Testament. It can have these comfort associations with it, but it has a lot to do with encouragement or spiritual strengthening. It's not just that God makes you feel better when you're having a hard time, it's that God is strengthening you, spiritually strengthening you. And in this passage, because he wants you to be able to comfort others in the future. What's the answer to why God allows his children to suffer? One of God's many reasons is stated explicitly in verse four. He comforts us in all our afflictions so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction. God comforts or strengthens us so that we can turn around and minister to others. He's getting us ready to minister to others in the future. I told you that my wife Trudy and I, we lived in Turkey for seven years. One of the reasons I believe that God took us to Turkey and allowed us to face various pressures there was that he was preparing us to minister to others in the future. Why did God take us away from our families for many years? I'll tell you what, I remember the tearful goodbyes in San Francisco airport as we said goodbye to our families going out, thinking we were gonna be out for a, th a few year stint without even knowing when we were coming back. Literally, my wife and I, we cried on that plane all the way across the continental United States and about halfway across the Atlantic. That was hard. Why did God do that? Well, of the thousands of reasons, one of those is God was preparing us to minister to others in the future. Why did God place us in a situation where we were foreigners, didn't know the language or understand the culture, where it was noisier, people didn't give us the same sort of space that they give? where people commented regularly upon whether you had gained or lost weight and asked you how much your watch cost. Why? Because God was getting us ready to minister to others in the future. Why did he move in our hearts to open up a new city where there was no one working? A city of one million people that was 100% Muslim. Why did he take us to a place where we were certain to face loneliness and hardship? A place where we lived in a fishbowl where people talked about us all the time. Part of that, of the thousands of reasons that God might have was to get us ready to minister to others in the future. Why did he allow us to walk through a difficult conflict with one coworker, the hostility of one young believer that we never did anything but seek to love, ongoing stomach and intestinal problems, a very intimidating police raid on a meeting, two months of death threats. Why did God allow us to go through that? I don't know everything, but one of those 
is that God might be preparing us to minister to others. And then he brought us back to the United States for a big dose of reverse culture shock. What was that all about? Of all the things that God might be doing in any situation, we believe that one of the reasons God did this in our lives, also based upon this passage, is God was preparing us to minister to others. My wife and I speak regularly with young adults who are praying about going overseas. We're able to minister to them. We met last week with a married couple who actually lives in Turkey and is on their way into a new ministry, and it's going to be a tough ministry. We feel that, very similar to the type of ministry we went into when we were there. We were able to encourage them and strengthen them. And we have counseled people through the hardships that they have faced on the field. I don't know all the reasons that God had for all of those things that he did, but I know one of them. God strengthened us again and again and again and again while we were overseas so that we might be able to be his instrument to do this to others in the future. Why does God allow his children to suffer? Well, of the thousands of reasons he might have, one of those is to prepare us to minister to others in the future. The second reason God allows his children to suffer to bring them to a place of deep trust. Look at verses eight through 10. For we do not want you to be unaware, brothers, of the affliction we experienced in Asia for we were utterly burdened beyond our strength so that we despaired of life itself. Indeed, we felt that we had received the sentence of death, but that was to make us rely not on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. He delivered us from such a deadly peril and he will deliver us. On him, we have set our hope that he will deliver us again. God allows his children to suffer to bring them to a place of deep trust. He starts out in this section by talking about the affliction that he endured in Asia. What happened to Paul in Asia? Well, he's not specific here, so we don't know for sure. Here's what we do know. It probably happened near Ephesus, but not in Ephesus, otherwise he probably would have said Ephesus. It occurred after Paul wrote 1 Corinthians, but obviously be before he wrote 2 Corinthians. It was truly horrific. It was psychologically ultra-traumatic on Paul. So much so that British New Testament scholar C.H. Dodd, he refers to this particular event in his life as Paul's second conversion. Now this is overstated, no doubt, but he recognizes how very important it was. This was unique in Paul's experience. I mean, this was a unique sort of suffering. His language shows that here. And this is interesting coming from a guy who had already suffered a huge amount. Before the time he wrote this, he had already been whipped five times, beaten with rods three times, stoned and left for dead, been in three separate shipwrecks, floated probably on a piece of wood from a sunken shipwreck for 24 hours out in the Mediterranean um, or Aegean Sea, holding on to a part of a sunken ship. He experienced pain from failure in the churches he had planted. He'd been opposed by people who taught false doctrine in those same churches. He'd been slandered. He'd been accused of evil motivations. He'd been sick. Even in this letter, 2 Corinthians, he describes himself as often near death. And he tells us that it was because of sickness that he preached to the Galatians. And he just experienced straight up satanic opposition. And in some way, this event here was worse than all of those. And if you look at the passage, you look at it closely, you'll see that it looks like he expects he might have more of it in the future. So what was it specifically? Some people have said that it might have been persecution from local, local authorities, maybe some terrible, you know, uh, prison, imprisonment with the accompanying things that would have gone on in the first century and that. Some people have suggested maybe he was attacked by a mob. And uh, quite a few people have suggested, and I think it's probably the best, but I'm not absolutely certain, that it was some sort of debilitating sickness that brought Paul a lot of pain and brought him right to the point of death, and he expected it to come again, and it caused him to despair. Now, you don't have to know precisely what was going on to be ministered to by this passage, but do look at the passage. I don't think that there's any darker language, in, at least in Paul's writings. You uh, only get language like this maybe in the Bible in places like Jeremiah. Look at these descriptors. He was weighed down. He was burdened exceedingly, utterly, beyond our strength, so that we despaired even of life. And then literally at one point he says, ourselves, within ourselves, we had the sentence of death. And he describes it as so terrible a death, or sometimes it's translated as the deadly peril. 
But we're back to our question again. Why did God allow this in Paul? I mean, this is Paul. He had forsaken everything to follow Jesus. He had to travel all the time. He forwent marriage. He suffered a lot for Christ. Why did God allow him to suffer more than he already had? And in the darkest way that he'd ever suffered before in his life. The answer again is that God in his sovereignty may have a thousand reasons that God uh, might be doing this. But one of those reasons is stated explicitly about Paul in verse nine. It says this, indeed we felt that we had received the sentence of death, but that was to make us rely not on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. God allows his children to suffer to bring them to a place of deep trust. I don't know if you've ever thought about this. One of the most important things you're gonna ever wrestle with in your Christian life is this. God cares more about your trust than he cares about your comfort. He wants to bring you to a place of dependence or reliance or surrender, a posture of absolute surrender to him, trusting in him. It's crucial. It's one of the most basic things in your Christian life. And he will allow you sometimes to suffer to bring you there. I told you before we opened our hands and our hearts before the Lord at the beginning of this passage that this passage became very, uh, extremely important to me this last year in relationship to my daughter Lydia. Uh, a year and a half ago, my then 23-year-old daughter Lydia, who had just graduated from Biola's nursing program here, and interestingly enough, Lydia, who was actually born in the region where this particular events are taking place. She was born in Asia Minor, right in the center, uh, maybe just down even the road from where Paul had experienced this. She left our family and she flew over to Mindanao on the southern Philippines to spend a year there in a training program that is training up Filipino young people who are going cross-culturally within the Philippines, but in different language groups, different people groups, the 13 unreached Muslim people groups of the southern Philippines. She was going there to teach them health skills, to uh, teach them other types of things, to minister alongside of them in their outreach in the Muslim villages that were there, and to be their school nurse. She had been there most of that year when she became very ill, and then a whole series of events started to unfold. We first heard that she was somewhat sick and had been for a couple weeks. And some American doctors had seen her. She was running a low-grade fever, and they suggested that she probably had malaria. So they began to treat her for this. Then a few days later, we heard that she had, she had taken a really bad turn for the worse, and that they were trying to get her down from the mountains where the particular school was, down the mountains to a small hospital in a small city that was a, a ways away, but they were trying to get there in the middle of the night, but that it was raining really hard and mud had covered the roads and it was impassable, they couldn't get out. So we elicited every, everyone we possibly could to pray and hundreds of people began praying that she would just get down there. The next morning they admitted her to the hospital and an American nurse named Donna, bless her, I'll just publicly bless this woman right now, she saw our daughter Lydia. She said, I don't think this is malaria. I think this is typhoid fever. Donna had actually lived her life in the Philippines and she'd seen a number of cases, dozens of cases of typhoid fever. Let me tell you something about typhoid. It starts really slowly. It works up very slowly. If you catch it in the first couple of weeks, it's quite treatable. But if you get past the third week into the fourth week, it very quickly becomes fatal. And this probably, they found out that she had it in her fourth week. So they, they um, administered to her um, third generation drugs, the best drugs that you possibly could, tried to flood her with antibiotics and she started to feel a little bit better. So just because it was a better situation, they took her out of the hospital and Donna took her to her home and she just cared for her in her home for a few more days. A few days later we heard we thought that she was getting better, but then we heard that she had taken a very bad turn for the worse and she was having abdominal pains in the night and that they had readmitted her to the hospital. And I just need to be honest with you, that was a really hard day for me because by now I knew typhoid fever, I knew what it did. What can happen is that the walls of the intestines and the walls of the stomach can actually be breached and your whole entire system can be flooded with the infection that you have and death often follows quickly after that. People were praying, we were praying. I'll tell you what, I was shaky that day. 
That was not an easy day for me. And my wife, bless her, she's over here. She looked at me. I remember I wrote it in my journal. She said, I will trust in the Lord no matter what happens. Even if Lydia dies from this disease, I would much rather that she died while following the Lord's call in the Philippines than to die while following her own way in the United States. Ladies, if you ever have a chance to speak something like that to your husbands, do it. <laughs> Those words strengthened me and they helped me. When morning came, a very long night, Lydia was still alive. Her intestines had not ruptured, though there was probably a little breach in them, and that would lead to something later on. God had delivered her from this deadly peril, the first of two, actually. Everyone on that end believes it was a direct answer to prayer. Um, the woman uh, who was caring for her, Donna, had never seen anyone live past that, past that point. Verse 10 says, he delivered us from such a deadly peril, and he will deliver us. On him we have set our hope that he will deliver us. The next day, Lydia was able to Skype with us very briefly, and she asked Trudy to come and pick her up and bring her home. We immediately started making plans. She was very sick, but gradually felt bits of improvement. Trudy got on the plane, flew the whatever it is, 17 hours to Manila, did the transfer down to Mindanao, two hours. She was picked up at the airport by two of Lydia's colleagues, and Lydia was, of course, not with her. And they were about 10 minutes in, and they told, they told Trudy that Lydia had been admitted to the hospital again, and that she was going downhill quickly. So they quickly got some food, took Trudy to the hospital, and she slept on a little bench next to Lydia's bed for the next three nights. They didn't know what was wrong with her. They didn't know what was going on. But just in case they put a particular antibiotic in her, I found out about this. I was actually driving toward an intercessory prayer time at our church. I'm an elder, or we call them overseers at our church. And we, we pray for people once a month. They come out and we lay our hands on them and we pray for them. And we were going out there and I found out about this. And so instead of praying for others, a couple of the other overseers joined together with me and we prayed together. And one of the overseers, Joe, I remember, it was just as though he was filled with the Spirit. He prayed, Lord, I pray that they will land on the right medicine even though they're shooting in the dark. I just pray that they'll land on it. It's like he's praying in faith and I joined with his faith and guess what? That's what happened. We found out after that that Lydia had sepsis, which is a blood infection and even more dangerous in many ways than typhoid fever often leads to death very quickly and God delivered her the second time from the doorstep of death itself. Lydia was eventually able to get out of the hospital. Trudy packed up her life there and they flew across the ocean. It took Lydia six months to recover from this. And last, just this past December, just, uh, just over a month ago, she looked at me and she said, Dad, I think I'm 100%. Why did God allow my daughter to suffer in this way? Why did God allow Lydia's father, it's me, and her mother, <laughs> and her sisters, and her friends, and all those praying for her, to internally suffer along with her. Why did God do this? You know what, I don't know all of God's reasons. God may have a thousand reasons for this, but one of the reasons we believe is that God would take her and us to a deeper place of trust in Him. Let me read you parts of the letter that Lydia wrote to her prayer supporters after her second hospitalization and after her first of two deliverances from death, June 6, 2014. Hello friends, thank you for your continued prayers for me. Many of you may not realize how important your prayers have been, so I would like to share a part of my recent story with you. You may remember getting an email a little over a week ago letting you know that I was taken to the hospital in the middle of the night and asking for your prayers. Well, the actual reason we went to the hospital was because both I and the experienced nurse I was staying with thought I was showing signs, signs of peritonitis, basically a perforated intestinal wall that requires surgery, one of the serious complications of typhoid fever. Turns out that earlier that day, I had been asking my nurse friend about the previous typhoid patient she had cared for. She told me that she had never had a patient survive who had gotten that far along in the disease. Needless to say, my imagination began to work. I stopped and asked a question, am I ready to die tonight? It was a question I'd asked myself before, but never with the thought that it really could be my last night. 
I then began talking to God. Is the work you've called me to do on this earth complete? Have I used my time here wisely? As I lay there thinking, I realized that if God in his infinite wisdom wanted to take me home that night, then I would joyfully go, knowing that I would be going to a place where there are no more tears or pain or suffering and where I would spend eternity with the Lord. My prayers then turned to praying for all of you whom I knew would be grieved by my leaving, but I was encouraged that God would be able to take care for all of you just like he cares for me. These were my thoughts on the night I thought I would die. But God had other plans for me. When morning came, all the dangerous signs we had been watching began to disappear. I am convinced, as are many people here, that this is directly a result of all of your prayers. I guess God's plan for my life is not over yet. And while I still long for heaven, I look forward to seeing what God has yet to do with me here on earth. Because of his grace, Lydia. Can you see how, from this letter, can you see how God brought her to a place of deeper dependence on him? God used this in my life too to remind me, my life is not my own, nor is the life of my daughter. That life is short and must be lived entirely for Jesus, for nothing else that Jesus is worthy, including worthy of our deaths. In short, it brought me to a place of trusting Christ more fully. Why does God allow his children to suffer? Well, there are a thousand reasons, but two of them are to prepare us to minister to others in the future and to bring us to a place of deep trust in him. We hope you enjoyed this message. Biola University offers a variety of biblically-centered degree programs, ranging from business to ministry to the arts and sciences. Learn more at biola.edu.